Well, welcome to beautiful, sunny Orlando, Florida, the Ritz Carlton, JW Marriott, the NFL annual league meetings, also called the owners meetings. Matt, how are you enjoying this weather? There are people, it's beautiful. There are people who have enough money that they can stay in these hotels. This is insane. Now we've been here before for the owners meetings. It's also been at the breakers in West Palm. These hotels are unbelievably gorgeous. And I would say the people who can afford them are owners, and general <laughs> managers, and they're staying here. And uh, we are actually on the lawn right now. It's, I think it's called the Da Vinci lawn. I think it's what this is called. Yeah. And tonight we are recording this on Monday. Tonight there was this big reception. It's one of the highlights of the week when we're here. And you, you, you put the mics down, you put the cameras down. It's everybody who's anybody in the NFL. It's a great big party, but it's a very social gathering. And you just walk up to people and you introduce yourself. You say hello and you get to know them and you build a relationship and they want to talk to you. They do if they don't, but everybody's pretty cool. And it doesn't matter if it's Roger Goodell or an owner or a head coach or whatever. A lot of times those are the best conversations that you have. And even if they don't lead to anything in the short term, it is something that leads to a relationship. It builds a relationship that, of course, goes a long way, not just in this industry, but in any industry. So, yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's a fun event and it's especially bougie. As you can imagine, these types of places do not have skimpy events. All right. So. That happens tonight, and a lot of that is kind of off the record, if you will. Mm -hmm. We already heard on the record Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott. We got here on Sunday. We heard from Brandon Bean. I'm sure a lot of people have already seen some of the quotes or heard some of the things that he said. But let's kind of recap some of the things that stood out to you mostly. He was asked about players leaving, players coming in, salary cap. What stood out to you? What were the highlights and the major takeaways? So to me, a lot of the conversation, understandably so, was about the guys who have left, not the guys that they have brought in. But it was really interesting to me the way that Brandon Bean talked about Tredavious White and Micah Hyde because he did not close the door on a potential return for either of them. I still think it's unlikely. Like, I do not think that Trey White or Micah Hyde are going to play for the Bills, at least right now. But I don't also think it's impossible. Like, I feel like that's very – these people, general managers, coaches, front office staff, they're very intentional with what they say. And the fact that they did not close the door and say, hey, we wish them all the best in their future, hope that they get to a great landing spot, like that did not happen. So to me, that is newsworthy. That is notable. I don't know if it's showing up when people watch this, but look, there's a there's a thumb. Every time you do this, it recognizes your thumb and it actually has a an emoji that shows up on the screen. Oh, wow. That's I think that's what's happening here, which is incredible. Oh. Do that again. Do I what you're doing. People are liking the video and it's live. It's not live. No, we're recording this. And it's an, look at there it is again. Yeah. What is going on? I don't know. Maybe you can see it. Maybe you don't. It's kind of cool, right? So the technology is amazing. All right. That said, they are both in different, completely different situations. Micah Hyde is maybe even retiring. We don't know that. He hasn't given the Bills any indication if he's going to retire or not retire. And if he decides he wants to play, then, hey, is it going to be in Buffalo? With him, it really comes down to, look, I think the Bills would welcome him back, but it's got to be at a low rate. And considering Micah's age, what he's done in his career, and the injuries he's had in his family, I'm not sure Micah Hyde would want to do that at that particular rate. If he wants to play, and it's a rate that he kind of feels that he is, you know, worthy enough and, you know, worth – I don't see him signing a small deal, so it would have to be somewhere else, and I think it would be challenging for the Bills to fit him in there. Yeah, I agree. I think of the two, Micah, there's a stronger chance of a return, not just because of the situation, but also because where would Trey go? Like, Trey is not going to come back here to be a backup. I just don't see that happening. Somebody is going to want to take a chance on Tredavious White, even with the injury risks and the history there. But Micah Hyde is somebody who I think could come back and play on a snap count, play a smaller role. I've always gotten the sense, and this is just my opinion, that Micah Hyde will either retire or play for the Buffalo Bills. I never thought that he would just go out there. Like for Jordan Poyer, this makes too much sense, that he's going to the Miami Dolphins. His family is in South Florida now. There were connections there last year. That does not shock me at all. Micah Hyde, I don't think, would just go take a contract around that, a $2 million contract, to go somewhere else. I just don't think that's going to happen. Maybe if there's a team that has an injury at safety or a team that's a legit contender wants him there, then he'll go do that. But I think it's either decide if you want to play football, and if you want to do that, are you willing to take a pretty team-friendly contract that the Bills could be giving you? And then when it comes to Tredavia's situation, we do know he's visiting, he reports, the yeah. Rams and the Raiders. Yeah. I think for him, as opposed to Micah, it would really come down to, I think a team looks at him and says, I don't know what we're getting in him. Mm -hmm. We can't really pay him. He's coming off the injury. I was very surprised when Brandon said, 
something about getting, you know, possibly Tredavious White coming back. Um, Mac, if they did that, they'd have to count all the dead money and sign him to a new contract. I mean, I think that that's challenging in its own right, mm-hmm. but you're right. I don't see him being a backup. To me, it would have to be a last resort. I would also tell you, I think it doesn't have to be this year. I think his comment also means, hey, maybe he goes somewhere for a year or he doesn't wind up playing because of the injury he's rehabbing, and then he comes back next year and he's sure. off the books with a new contract. Sure, that's a good point. So I do think that there's a chance we see – one of them, both of them, again, I'm still not banking on it, but I do think that it's interesting that they didn't say, you know, like wish them well. Is Did you see that there were like just fireworks behind? Oh, yeah. Them? I don't know what's going on. This happened too when I was recording something else um, not long ago, but if you're watching on the stream, sorry, it's at the Sal Sports YouTube page. Whether you see it or not, I'm not sure. We don't even know how it's going to turn out, but there's like anytime you say something or something happens, maybe it's in the background, fireworks show up, emojis show up. I have no idea. This is like when my son is playing with some sort of like Snapchat. Yeah, for sure. So there's a lot of cool effects that are happening right now. I also think we also have, by the way, we, look at that. We have a, that 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 the fountain back behind us. There's a golf course back there. The golf course is where they do the father son invitational, oh. where Tiger and Charlie always play. Justin Thomas and his father always play. So it's like a very legitimate golf course that is also very expensive, as you could imagine. So there's a lot of other things that kind of we took away from the press conference. Do you want to start with Brandon Bean? Do you want to do Sean? How do you want to break it up? Well, I'll, I'll let's stay with Brandon Bean, and then we'll get to Sean because he spoke on Monday morning. Um, Brandon was asked specifically what kind of wide receiver are you looking for in the draft if to fit in or wherever? I thought it was really interesting. His answer he gave, because he said they got to pay multiple positions, be able to be move around. Obviously you have to be able to be smart, be smart, play multiple positions. Do we have a redundancy of something like that? Right. And, you know, be able to run with the ball in your hands. So I think it's really interesting. They're not just looking for, he's a boundary guy. He's not just looking for, he's a slot guy, a guy that can do everything. It also tells me, by his answer and by Sean, they're going to use Curtis Samuel in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I think Curtis Samuel is going to play a pretty big role on this offense moving forward. Brandon talked about how Joe Brady was kind of the piece that convinced him that he was worth the investment. Now, Brandon obviously had experience with Curtis Samuel because he was in the draft class. He took Christian McCaffrey with his first pick and Curtis Samuel, I believe, with their second pick. So they went Samuel McCaffrey or McCaffrey Samuel back to back. So he obviously knew him from the scouting process. And then he said Joe Brady knew him from his time in Carolina and Curtis Samuel's best year was with Joe Brady as the offensive coordinator. So he thinks that with Josh Allen and the other pieces the Bills have, there is a ton of untapped potential. And then hearing Sean McDermott talk about him also earlier this morning, I think that he is going to have a pretty substantial role. Now, when I say all that, there's going to be people who are listening or watching, and they're going to groan, and they're going to say, oh, no, now they're not going to go get a wide receiver. I don't think that for a second. I think they're thinking of Curtis Samuel as their clear-cut number two slash three guy, and then they are hoping whoever they add in the draft can be the other side of that, whether that guy turns into being the two or it's the three. I just think that for right now, Curtis Samuel is probably the two. They draft somebody who I think will definitely play a role, and then over time they'll flip-flop or something like that. Brandon Bean also answered a direct question about where the Bills are salary cap-wise. It's always game day in Buffalo, Sal Capaccio, Matt Bove, beautiful Orlando, Florida. It's going to be a high about 80 today, and then I think like 86 tomorrow during the day. So uh, getting some sun in here after we left Buffalo, it was 16 degrees when I got on my flight uh, on Buffalo in Buffalo on Sunday. Brandon Bean asked directly, where are you with the salary cap? A lot of times GMs kind of give you a hey, roundabout. Well, you know, he actually said, hey, I think he said we're about six to seven under. That's amazing considering there are 40 million over. But even more so, I didn't think they would even have that much. Matt, that's, that just does not count getting $10 million more available when Tredavious White's salary and debt uh, comes off the books, uh, the, the cap hit. They then will get to 16 to 17, obviously. Now they will need money for their draft picks. But honestly, salary cap-wise, because of the top 51 rule, they only need about $4 million for draft picks. But the way he explained it, I thought he was saying they actually have between six and seven in cap space, and the other money is allocated to the draft. Like, I thought – that that was the way he phrased. Well, it is, but they won't need that much. No, I know, but I'm saying I think that they actually have right now like ten and a half million dollars in cap space, and that they actually have six million that they can spend. That's the way that I took that. You took it. No, I think he said directly to me. I they said he said they have between to me. They he said between six and seven million. Then they're going to get ten million more when when Tre'Davious White's comes off the book. But he said 
we have to allocate for draft picks and we have to have replacement costs. So I think he's saying, look, we have six to seven million. We can't spend all that Mm -hmm. because we have to do this. And even when we get the 10 million, we got to make sure draft picks, injuries, replacement costs. So to me, the way I understand it, we can go back and listen. This is great because I want to go back and listen to me. I think they have six to seven million right now. They're going to have 16 to 17 if they make zero changes Mm -hmm. between now and June 1st. Okay. Yeah. I think that we're, basically saying I just when I took it because he led by saying well we've need the money to sign these guys in the draft we need this we need this so we effectively have this I thought he was saying okay on top of we know but what regardless the bills have a little bit of wiggle room I certainly do not think they're done we've talked on the podcast several times about how only the top 51 contracts count right now they're going to go out and sign more depth guys there's going to be guys that they sign at defensive tackle at defensive ends a lot of guys that they could probably decide that they want to bring back or Probably go sign another running back somewhere. These are not going to be big contracts, and they might not even count because they're probably not top 51 contracts. So Bean explained that, and he also was very uh, kind of aggressive and to the point about the fact that he felt the Bills got screwed, basically, on getting a fourth-round comp pick instead of a third-round comp pick for Tremaine Edmonds. Here's the deal. When Tremaine Edmonds left for the Chicago Bears last year, the four-year $52 million contract he signed basically translated to, okay, the Bills should get a third-round comp pick. The Bills, even Brandon Bean said, they were in contact with the league all year, and it was trending that way. Suddenly, they get a fourth, and they have basically appealed it. That man, San Francisco, they go to Zoom calls, both of them, and at the end of the day, they're still only getting a fourth. He said, we think we got a raw deal. Yeah, it was pretty, you know, candid from him, yeah. honestly, because I think he's not I, – I don't think. I know he's mad because the yeah. third-round pick is a drastic – massive difference between a third and a fourth round pick. And then when you think back to them making the Russell Douglas trade, it's not like they would do any of that over. Russell Douglas has been awesome for them and will be a starter moving forward. But I think that probably is a little bit easier to give up a third round pick if you know you're at least getting one back and you're going to have three top three picks, a one, a two, and a three. Now they don't have that. So that's another player that they could have desperately added. I think in a third round pick, you're just taking whatever guy you think is the best player on the board Regardless of the position, we've seen them do that with linebacker for the last several years, just guys that they really like. But they could have used a third-round pick on a center if they didn't like what McGovern did this year, and then they move him back to guard. They could have used it on a guard for somebody who could replace David Edwards, and they don't have that luxury now. I think even more so to me, I think it it it's capital they can't use the trade. I, I think there's a ch- chance here that he, he might move up in the draft to get a guy, wide receiver, possibly, but – to me, this really lessens your chance to move up even further in the draft if you don't have that third-round pick to kind of use as a little bit of sweetening. I agree, but I don't think that the third would have ever been the sweetener. Like, unless they're making a pretty substantial jump, I think you can do that with fourths and fifth-round picks. So, if like let's say Brian Thomas is the guy. They love Brian Thomas. They want Brian Thomas, whatever it is. If you're getting from 28 to 20, that doesn't cost you a third-round pick. That probably costs you some other stuff which you would totally be willing to pay if you really like the player. So, yeah, I mean, they, of course, would choose to have a third, but that's not the way it works. I just don't understand. Why did Cincinnati not get the pick, and then they changed it and then got the pick? It's a good question, and nobody really understands the entire formula, but the way Brandon Bean explained it, and this is how it works, it's first of all, you have to lose more free, free agents than you gain who qualify. How do you qualify? A certain amount of contract that you sign. But then it comes into what the average per year is, playing time and incentives. And because these teams, like the Bills, are – and putting all these void years in these guys' contracts, it's impacting all of those numbers, and that's basically how we explain it. So he definitely was not happy about that. All right, let's turn our attention to Sean McDermott. Unless you have anything else on Brandon you want to say. No, but I just opened this can of water for anybody who's watching on the stream. That's kind of the level of fancy we're dealing with this in this hotel that is a can of water. Also, I read the comments on YouTube. Somebody was yelling the other day that I was drinking water while we were recording this. Like, I'm going to have a drink. Leave me alone. I mean, we're, I do. We're, we're talking for an hour straight. Yeah. That's what, I mean, like, come on. I'm trying to get my 128 ounces of water a day. Let me live, man. <laughs> All right. Anything on Brandon you want? And let's, then we'll turn our attention to Sean. Brandon, the only other thing that stood out to me from Brandon, we talked about Curtis Samuel. We talked about the compensatory pick. We talked about Micah Hyde and Tredavious White. Oh, I asked him if I thought this was fairly interesting. Was there a goal that you had going into free agency or a position that you were targeting? And you can't answer that question before because you pigeonhole yourself. He can't come to the combine and say, yes, we desperately need to do this because then he's showing his hand and everybody will know. He said, like, we needed to address defensive tackle from two standpoints. One, 
a, just a body standpoint, but two, we need more out of that position. Just watch the game against the Chiefs in the playoffs. Their defensive line did not do really anything. So that's why they wanted to bring Daquan Jones back. Daquan Jones, by the way, in that game was only a couple weeks off an injury that brought him back. So I think they're expecting more from Daquan moving forward. And then Austin Johnson is not just another, hey, here's a depth signing of a guy who might make the team. This is a guy who they think is kind of like Daquan and could play a heavy rotation on this team. I actually loved the way, because you were sitting next to me this morning, you were talking about it on the radio. Austin Johnson is the guy you bring in on third and three, third and two, when you know that there's a chance that, you know, they're going to run the ball or they're going to do something. You put those guys on the field. So defensive tackle is an area that they've addressed. It also, to me, means it's not something that I would rule out in the first round of the draft, Mm -hmm. but it also doesn't necessarily seem like it's something that has to happen because they have kind of paid a lot of money to address that position so far. You mentioned the Chiefs, the transition to Sean McDermott. I actually got a chance to catch up with Andy Reid right after Sean McDermott talked, and I said, what are the Bills getting of Mike Edwards? And Andy obviously was you know, very appreciative and uh, complimentary of Mike Edwards, but he said basically he's a guy that can really he, – he, he used the words, he gets it several times. Mm-hmm. And I like that because that's Sean's defense, right? you got to get it. you got to be able to get it. He's going to fit in. And then I said – interestingly enough, I said, how will he fit in Sean's system? You know Sean's system, Andy. And he goes, well, he runs basically the same system as Spags, right? Like they're, they're very similar. So Mike Edwards is going to fit very well in Sean's system. Yeah, and this is kind of a nice, easy transition to what Sean said about Mike Edwards. And he said from a distance, he's been watching him as a guy who has only gotten a handful of starts. And when he's gotten those starts, he has seen something that he really is intrigued by, the way he plays the position, his versatility of the things that they can do with him. It feels like there's a lot of untapped potential with Mike Edwards. It feels like they are bringing in this guy because they think with their defense and the pieces around him, he could really be a solid player for them. He's already got the knack for the big play, which is something that they, of course, value with their safeties. He's got the versatility that they like. It just I said it when they signed him. It, it feels eerily similar to kind of the Jordan Poyer deal when they made it all those years ago. Mike Edwards joins the Bills' safety room with Taylor Rapp, Cam Lewis. They resign. We'll see if they do more work on that, but I feel like that's maybe an area where they might add some depth, especially youth at the at the safety position as they go forward. McDermott also said no decision has been made yet on who is going to call defensive plays, whether it's Bobby Babich or him. He also said, I'm in no rush to make that decision. Mm-hmm. You think he knows? Yes. Absolutely, he does. And I think Bobby Babich knows. And I don't know if they got to sign like an NDA where they're not allowed to talk about it until a certain point. I think they both know. I think that that would have been a factor in if Bobby Babich took the job or not. Even if that means Sean is still calling plays, I'm sure there's a contingency plan of like, okay, well, we'll do it for a year to kind of get your feet wet. And then next year you ultimately take over or something along those lines. I think they both know. I think they're just trying to figure out the right time to kind of put it out there. Yeah, we'll see if they do that, you know, at, OTAs, mini camp. We might go into camp, training camp, and literally we may be seeing both of them kind of do it, and they don't tell us exactly what's going on. So it's going to be really interesting, interesting to watch that all going forward. Sean also talked about the guys who the Bills released, and he got even, I think, a little bit emotional about it. Sean McDermott asked about Tredavious White specifically, and that was one that really hit when he was sitting at the table and talking with us. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is his first draft pick when he was here. Interesting. We never heard this before. He said when Tredavious got hurt against Miami, a bunch of people went to his house afterwards. And he goes, this is on the heels of last year. What do you say to him? What do you say? What do you say when you have this conversation? You know, eventually it's going to happen. But he said, it's like, you don't even think, I can't believe we're having this conversation right now. Like, that's what's surreal about it. Yeah, he said that he believes that Tredavious White is one of the best defensive backs in the history of the Buffalo Bills. And he thinks that there was a bunch that there was left to be accomplished with the two sides, but the injuries kind of derailed that from just a human standpoint. It was pretty powerful stuff. It was pretty emotional stuff. It's not a side we often see with Sean McDermott just because Trey does mean so much to him. Everybody has always known that's his guy. That was his pick. That was the first guy of kind of this entire new wave. And I do think the conversation would be very different if the Miami injury doesn't happen or if the other injury didn't happen. But now that it's been two in three seasons, and the cap hit that's associated there, it just – the Bills did not have the luxury of trying to figure this out when they have Christian Benford and Rasul Douglas. So it, it just stinks that it did not work out, and I do think – I do – I would bet on Trey White. I just – the way that I think of him as a player and his work ethic and just getting to know him over the years, that is not a player that I think is done. On the offensive line, we know Connor McGovern is going to start out and shift over to center. Now, 
He said he has a background, not a ton. I did some research on Connor McGovern and great job, by the way, if you get a chance, Tim Graham of the athletic did a really nice piece on Connor McGovern interviewing about it. And I learned from that piece, Matt, Connor McGovern was the third highest ranked center in the country coming out of high school before he went to Penn state. Then he went to Penn state and he played center there, but then in the NFL, he was with the Cowboys, the bills, they already had center. So, you know, he didn't play there. He's going to transition to center. I think they're comfortable with it. But what was interesting to me was he talked a lot about David Edwards also having that ability or the flexibility. Now they have Will Clapp. So I feel like they're in a spot now where think about the overhaul there. You had Mitch Morris and Ryan Bates, who were clearly one and two. And now it's Connor McGovern, Will Clapp, and David Edwards all in your interior and Alec Anderson are they're high on. Yeah, Will Clapp, we haven't done a podcast since they signed Will Clapp. What do you think of Will Clapp, the addition? Because he is somebody who has experience. Is this just the next guy yeah. is he's the sixth offensive lineman who's got position versatility yeah. to play inside at center or, I bet, or how about this? He plays what David Edwards did last year and becomes the jumbo package tight end. Okay. All right. And then we also not to steer away from this, but we haven't spoken since the Austin Johnson signing. What do you make of that one? Like you said a little while ago, I think this is a guy who, and you know, it's funny when it happens, a lot of people don't know his name, but they say defensive end. Oh, why they said a defensive end. He's not in that. He's a defensive tackle in the bill scheme. He's going to play, Four three inside defensive tackle, even over the nose, he'll you know when they do that one technique is what they call it between the center and the and the guard three technique or one technique. That's where Daquan Jones also plays. That's where Ed Oliver plays. But he can play defensive end in a three four if he can kick outside in a three man alignment. I love the fact that it seems like they got in a lot of ways. I'm not saying he's as good as him necessarily a Daquan Jones clone. Yeah, well, once again, when you were talking about Connor McGovern with Penn State, yeah. then I thought back to Sean talking about how. Daquan Jones and Austin Johnson have a lot of chemistry from their days together at Penn State and that that played into the role. So, yeah, I, I just think that it's another smart addition for the team. I think he is a better depth option than what they've had. They tried last year with Puna Ford. It didn't work out. They tried with Tim Settle. He never reached the potential that we thought he was going to have. Jordan Phillips is obviously a very different player just hasn't been able to stay healthy. I still think there's a chance Jordan Phillips comes back next year. We haven't heard anything yet. Shaq Lawson. Shaq Lawson, exactly. So I do think that there are guys who were on the roster last year that could ultimately come back. Didn't they sign it? Did they sign a, another edge rusher too? Casey Tuhill. Casey Tuhill. We talked about Casey yeah. Tuhill. Casey Tuhill kind of feels like what Shaq Lawson has been for them. Right? I think it could be a Shaq Lawson replacement. Um, we'll see about that. But yeah, they, they have made a few moves here since we've, last talk, but it feels like most of their moves now are going to be kind of these lower level signings. There's nothing major. They're going to do the transition from here at the owners meetings into the NFL draft. I'm trying to remember some key points of what Sean McDermott talked about. Here's one offensively. I get the feeling here that this is not going to sound great to a lot of bills fans. I know you're going to be thinking, come on, Sean McDermott running the ball. The way he talks about defense is changing split safeties, two high safeties, being able to get bigger, run the ball because you can take advantage of that, throwing the ball underneath, allowing guys to run. I think the Bills are trying to transition to this type of game where, yes, you have Josh Allen. You can throw it over the top, but really that's going to be challenging. So you know what we got to do? We got to be able to make sure we can work everything underneath, whether that's running and missing tackles. He talked about that. Running after the catch with the ball in your hands and finding guys who can actually work underneath in these two high shells where there are there's some space. Yeah. Did you – the comparison that he made, do you remember what he said? I don't. The quarter ice? Oh, yes. I love it. Go ahead. I remember now. Go ahead. Sean McDermott said that all of these new schemes on defense are like corduroys. You've got to be. What did he say? I don't want to get this comparison wrong. He said, you want to be wearing corduroys when other people are wearing corduroys, but then they quickly go out of style and then they go back into the closet. And he said, or you could be really out there and you could wear the corduroys when nobody else is and make a statement for yourself. That's how he said he feels about the too high safety thing that's happening in the NFL and that this is a trend that they are, of course, aware of. But at the same time, just because everybody's doing it does not mean that that's got to be something that they make their bread and their butter. So I do think that the Bills are going to have some different looks because of the personnel play that they have, but I don't think it's going to be anything drastically different than what we've seen with Jordan Poyer and my guide. I'm going to be super honest here on this podcast. And I don't think I've ever revealed this publicly. When I was a kid and I went clothes shopping with my mom, we went to Hills and I bought corduroys before every year. I definitely had like about three or four different colored pairs of corduroys that I wore in fourth grade and fifth grade and so on. I don't know if I've ever had corduroy. I, I don't think I've ever had corduroy pants, actually. Do corduroy pants, when you walk, they like make that like little noise like the... I don't know if they, they had like a... You could, you could literally like... You had a rug when you go over one side, it's one color. That was... Yeah. You could do that with corduroys. Well, I, Sean says he has a pair in his closet. I did it doesn't. Ask- it doesn't surprise me. We're about the same age. I did ask the follow-up question. He said that he does have a pair of corduroys in his closet. So there you go. Maybe we'll see him on the sideline this year. All right. Let's wrap things up with a couple um, league business items here. Oh, Competition talk committee. The, talk about the new rule. Kick, kickoff change. Well, that's what I mean. Yes, that's what we're going to do right now. League items. Uh, kickoff change. 
I don't know where this is going. It feels like there's some momentum for it. They want to do something here. Here's at the end of the day, the, the bottom line is the competition committee wants more returns, but less injuries. And they're trying to balance that. And it's very hard to do it. It's just a very convoluted, confusing type of rule. Anytime you have that, it's not good for fans, but I also understand the intent of what they're trying to do here. I like it. I really, I'm intrigued by it. Me too. I think that it makes a ton of sense. You were explaining it to me a little bit more this morning, just with some of the little details with it. The thing that I don't understand though is, so please explain this to me. So you have the drop zone. You have two people that are in the drop zone. Two returners. Two returners that are in the drop zone. Everybody on the kicking team lines up at the 40. The opposite 40, yes. So the kicker for your team lines up at the your own 35 to kick it. On the opposite 40, over the 50-yard line, is where those guys are who run down to tackle. So then the guys who are getting the ball are at the 30? 35, five yards so between. That's, so that's what I was going to say. There's only five yards between them. That, yes. That's crazy to me. It's, they can line up between the 30 and 35. So you could create a 10-yard space if you wanted. Uh -huh. And there's no movement at all until the returner has – now the returners can move. Once the ball is kicked. Once the ball is kicked. So once the ball is kicked, once Tyler Bass kicks the ball off, then the returners, the two guys in the drop zone. Now, here's the other question. Can you just have one or does it have to be two? Do you know the answer? I believe it has to be two because the rule stated where nine guys have to be in the setup area. Okay. So, but then can that other guy move if the ball is in the air? Which other guy? The, the other returner. So let's say. No, neither, neither returner can move. Until the ball is, the kicked. Ball is kicked. They have to stop, stay in a certain spot on the field. But, okay, but once the ball is kicked. Let's and then say, go to the ball. Let's say the Bill, But let's say the Bills have Curtis Samuel and Khalil Shakir. And they kick it to the side of Curtis Samuel. Can Even when the ball is in the air, can Khalil Shakir start running towards him to set up as a block? 100%. Okay. All right. So. They can move wherever they want. Here's the other thing. The kicker cannot cross the 50-yard line after he kicks. What does he do? Just he just kind of hangs back. Deep safety. He <laughs> plays the deep half of the field. It doesn't try to get beat over the top. Another question that came up. What if the ball falls off the tee? Twice. Here's the answer. I didn't see this. They get to use a Patriots head coach. Gerard Mayo said Sunday that the team isn't locked into a selection at number three. Oh, yeah. Well, they're trying to play the game of draft. We're reading some news here as we go. Yeah, he's uh, from if, 40 feet away. That's real hilarious. If the ball falls off the tee twice, you know how a guy usually sets it up? Mm -hmm. Because all your guys are up front now, you use one of those sticks. No kidding. Yeah, and if once he kicks it, the referee picks the stick up. This is – and then the whole onside kick rule of this, too, is like – now, those are out the window? Out the window. Cannot kick an onside kick. People say, well, yes, you can. You just kick it 10 yards. No, it's a penalty. If you kick it, if the ball in any fashion lands before the drop zone, mm -hmm. so if you, the kicking team kicks it, Matt, and it hits somebody from the receiving team at the 30, or it just squibs. Guess what? Ball dead, receiving team gets it at their own 40-yard line. What I think ultimately happens here, if this gets approved. 35, I'm sorry. This gets approved, which is still, we don't know if that's going to happen. Teams are just going to kick it out of the back of the end zone and give it to you at the 30-yard line because yeah. the risk with actually kicking it off is greater than the five yard difference of what it has been for a touchback over the course of the years. Like Tyler Bass has the leg that he can kick it out of the end zone pretty much every time. This is really interesting. You say this because there's data on this and I will tell you what the NFL said. I love, I love that you're bringing this up because you talk about the difference. Rich McKay said scoring was down two points in the NFL this past year from 43 points a game. It went from 45 to 43. Yeah. And he actually, actually said, we'd like to be to near 45, even though 43 is fine. We'd like to be near 45. And he said that little bit of field position for those few yards could actually make that point, uh, two point difference maybe in a game. Yeah. Well, I, but is that, I don't know. I, it's, it's, it's weird to think about like that. It is weird to think about. I also think too, if you do this, and now every team would be dealing with the same thing, there's got to be a much bigger emphasis on a great returner, right? I think that's true. What I think there's also a more, more, much bigger emphasis on, hear me out on this, gone are the days where you need really fast, athletic guys to run down the field to tackle. Now you need more tacklers than speed guys. Yeah. You, you're going to be closer. You just got to be able to tackle. Do you think there's a way, like, do you think that there's substantial, a substantial chance that you could use your actual starters in this role or do you think that it'll strictly be because i mean if this is going to play a bigger emphasis on the game you want your best athletes out some there. teams will like you're you're talking about i'm thinking about the bills like if they were defending a kickoff like their safeties would be out there wouldn't you think 
Very possible. And by the way, the Bills don't have a dedicated return man other than Khalil Shakir on their team right now. He's not even dedicated. They need one. I think Curtis Samuel is going to return kicks for them. Oh, I don't know about that. That's a dangerous spot. I don't really think you want to do that. He's playing a lot on offense. This guy's not going to come off the field that much on offense. They talked about it. Like, I don't know if they were tipping their hand, but Brandon said, you know, he can use them a lot of different ways. And he said, including the return game. I mean, I don't know. They used to have Khalil and Micah do it. And those guys played big roles on their team. I'm not saying that it'll definitely be him, but I think there's a chance it could be. All right. We got to go. How have you gone to Disney yet? No. That'll happen later this week. So this is the last work day and then an Epcot day and a Magic Kingdom day will happen with a one-year-old. So she did unbelievable on the flight, though. She was it. so good. I'm so proud of her. All right. And everybody else, if you, I, thank you very much for the Australia response. I'm leaving for Australia on Thursday, going to Brisbane. I, My family and I and my friends that we're staying with, we are going into Brisbane in the city on my birthday, April 4th. So if you're a Bills fan out there and you can get to Brisbane, Australia, if you're in Australia, April 4th this day, I'm going to be in the city of Brisbane, inside the city proper, basically, in downtown, and we're going to find a way to meet some people. And also, this will probably be the last pod for a little. I will do something while Sal is gone, but we're not going to bother him while he is in <laughs> Australia. So he's going to enjoy Australia. I'll get a couple guest hosts. We'll do a couple podcasts. But in the meantime, this will be the last time you see us together for probably a couple weeks. All right. Thank you very much for coming aboard. Always Sal Sports on YouTube. And of course, wherever you pod, it's always game day in Buffalo. We'll talk to you next time.